I am really looking forward to today's chat. Um, I've patiently been waiting to talk with Emma, Emma Bowd, and I haven't met Emma in person, but I feel that I know her through our virtual connection, and I have been, Emma, I've been fangirling you for a long time. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I'm really looking forward to finding out more about you through our chat today, but just really quickly, I'm going to give our listeners a really quick snapshot and then I'm going to let you to dive into it um, deeper. But Emma is an internationally published and award-winning um, Australian author of books for adults and children. And she has just had her gorgeous book, Wonderful Shoes, read as story time on Play School. And for our international listeners, that is huge. Like Emma has that's huge. So we'll find out more about that. Um, Emma's also an experienced presenter. She's a passionate advocate for children's literacy, literacy, and especially in disadvantaged communities. And this is where I found um, Emma is through her um, planet-friendly social enterprise of deed bags. Um, and there's so much more. Emma, welcome. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you today. How are you? Oh, thank you, Catherine. It's just such a delight to be here today. My goodness. I feel, likewise, I feel like I know you as well through the deed bags and your lovely happiness hive. Yeah. Um, uh, I've really enjoyed your podcast too. I love, there's nothing I love more than listening to different people and their, the way they live their life. And there's little nuggets of gold that can be, you know, picked up from everywhere. Yes. Thank you. I love that. And that's what um, the podcast is absolutely about. And I have been so looking forward to this chat because really there are so many strings to your bow and yeah. I want to find out about all of them. Um <laughs> But maybe we could start with how did you get to have your storybook read on Play School? Yes, my how goodness. Did, yeah. Yes, what a surprise. So it was really recently read in October and I literally got an email from my publisher saying, oh, by the way, um, your book will be read on Play School Story, story Time on October the 19th um, at 7.20 a.m. And I had to read the email twice. And I what? what? And like you said, for the international visitors, you know, this is a program that's that's so iconic for Australians, especially sure, yeah. of our generation, because it started in the year before I was born. So it started in 1967. We grew up with it every day on the television. You know, I have a friend from uni who learnt to speak English by watching Play School and Sesame Street every day. She was in an immigrant household. So, you know, this show is absolutely dear to our hearts. And then our children grew up yes, with it. Yeah. And now the new generation, oh, my goodness, it's, it's gone to another level. There's apps and ABC Kids apps and this story time is its own app as well so um it it lives on beyond the day which is a it is wonderful and I think for me um gosh I mean apart from being absolutely joyous and just yeah. so fantastic yeah. to have your book read on play school story time it was a real validation of the book itself as an early learning book um subsequently um, one of the ABC um education consultants has reached out to me um who was um, responsible for choosing the books on the program um, and you know a lot goes into the, the choosing of the book so for me that professionally that was a really beautiful validation yes. of the book as as something worthwhile um, for early learning oh yeah. my gosh I'm so and for those um, who are listening I'm just going to give a plug for the book now I did say it before but wonderful shoes and how did you get to being a, an author like how did that come about Emma so this is a really great recognition but this is not the only recognition that you've had for your writing but how did you get into being an author it's really interesting I think you know if if you go if you want to just cut to the chase I think yeah. it really was my calling you know it was my earliest memory 
my yeah. vivid earliest memory was sitting at my parents' dining room table at about four years of age. I hadn't started school yet. Wow. And my dad, he was in the Air Force, and um, he used to bring home empty exercise books from work for me. Um, and I just filled them up with pretend writing, but writing stories. And I had this figurine that I used to carry around the house every day and make up stories. So I had this vivid imagination, and I would just write. I loved the physical process of writing. I was an only child at the time. My sister wasn't born yeah. for another year or two. Um, so there's some something innate in that that um, and but at the time of course I didn't know and when I was at school I was really studious so I as I went through school and primary school high school you know I was really quite academic and very um, high achieving and I thought that perhaps meant that I'd go into academia you know I'd never because as I got older I got less creative I got more into science and maths Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so I finished school doing pure maths, chem, physics, and my 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 favourite subject was my 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 joy subject that I chose, and that was geography. And surprise, surprise, it was all writing. It was oh, interesting out yes. in the world and writing about you know um, food shortages and current affairs and um, and writing, you know, which yes. I loved, and it was by far my favourite subject. But you know. I was also a feminist and it was the 80s and we had to do everything that the boys could do. So the big lesson for me, I think if I look back, I yeah. did the chemistry, the maths, the physics, because I could, perhaps not because I wanted to, perhaps not because it was my passion, but I had to prove that I could do it. Oh, wow. That's interesting. So, yeah, it's so interesting even on. when you're saying that, that, um, you know, being studious and academic and thinking that that might have been a career pathway choice for you. Also what you're saying there about, you know, feminist, feminism, um, proving, wanting to do it maybe because, not because it was your passion, but you were good at it. And I think that happens for a lot of people, a lot of women, Mm. that they pursue lifetime choices for various reasons. And, and sometimes it's for passion and joy. Um, a lot of the time it's not. No. So um, not, yeah. I spent, so in year 12, for example, my, my, my loves have always been the environment, geography, yes. travel. Um, my dad was in the Air Force. We travelled. I've moved a lot in my life. Yes. I've, I've lived, I'm a nomad, complete nomad, yeah. a rolling stone. Um, yeah, so I spent all my weekends sewing and I'd be sewing outfits for myself, for my friends. And then during the week, doing my maths, chem, physics, et cetera. But my passions that I spent all my time on in my in my spare yeah. time was sewing and fashion. And, you know, when you go to see a careers counsellor in year 12 and you're an A student in the maths and sciences, mm. fashion design or fashion school or anything to do that, that's not going to be your your what's going to come up in your choices. It's interesting, but, isn't it? And I think also our general, like we're, we're, we're similar age and, you know, maybe things have changed a bit now, but I certainly know um, I wasn't academic at all. So my, the career advice I got was very limited. And because I didn't kind of know, mm. um, I followed some of those things. For mm. not, I, I followed because I thought, oh, yeah, I don't know. So I'll just do it. And <laughs> I soon found yeah. out yeah. I didn't like I think, where I, I was I, directed. Mm. I think having had kids just gone through year 12 I think it has changed a bit yeah good yeah. counseling you know they're, they're very much getting them to be in tune with their passions and things and yeah look, I came from a family that was not well off so um I had to get a job that could earn money you know and in, and in a way a lot of fashion jobs you know you need that family money behind you and that background yeah. so um I knew that I needed to get a job that I could earn money and, and and then buy the clothes and shoes that I liked so that's kind of the way I went about it and to my parents credit you know I was never forced to do the traditional the law the yes, medicine yes. or whatever um, they really encouraged me to do what I wanted so when I left school I was very interested in um, nutrition and dietetics and at that time the only way to be a dietitian was to do a science degree with a major in biochem or microbiology and then a postgrad degree whereas now you can do it straight from school yes yeah um, so anyway so I went to uni you know I got really good grades but went to uni and did the science degree lived on camps had to move from North Queensland to Brisbane lived on campus and 
about after a year and a half of being in a science lab, you know, doing really hardcore biochem chemistry, yes. looking down a microscope yeah. every day, I knew I was in the wrong place. Oh. And I was really nervous to tell my parents that actually, because I knew what a financial struggle it was for, for them to have me at uni. Yes. But I, I, I really knew I was in the wrong place. So I plucked up the courage to tell them that I'd like to change courses. Um, so in the process of being at uni, I had met some really interesting girls who were doing occupational therapy which I'd never heard of when I was at school. I'd heard of the physio and your medicine and dentistry and law and everything, but I'd never really come across occupational therapy. Um, and it, it really appealed to me because of the holistic nature of yes. it, the, the mind, the body, the whole looking at the whole person. To me, it seemed much more sensible and it really interested me. So I broached the subject very nervously with my parents <laughs> to see if I could change across to occupational therapy. I'd already had the marks from school, so that was okay. But I also didn't want to waste the year and a half that I'd done in science. So I went and met with the dean, and at, by then I'd become interested in psychology. Um, and luckily enough, at UQ psychology was in the faculty of science and the faculty of arts so I was able to finish off my science degree at night by doing my psychology subjects at night um, while I did my OT subjects in the day so I, I finished six years of uni with a double degree in wow. science and occupational therapy and in my science I ended up doing my major in psychology which I loved every minute of. Isn't that interesting because when you were what, what I heard you saying is that you were into your degree um and then got that sense that this isn't what mm. I want to be doing and yep. also having the courage to talk to your parents about it. And I oh, know a lot yeah. of people, yeah, I know a lot of people stick to what they're doing because they don't want to let other people down. I see oh, that absolutely. a lot happening. So it's really great to... It to was it was, yeah. I was so nervous, but unbeknown to me, mum said one of the teachers at my school had said to her in year 12 when I'd chosen this... Um, science degree he said she will she will change courses she will not um, <laughs> so, so she was already she was yeah, already, already it, but yeah. no one told me <laughs> they just you know you, you're not you need to almost often go through things don't you to realize yeah that it's not the right decision or it doesn't feel right yeah, and to I'm readjust so course yeah. yeah not lock into so something bad. just for the sake of it yeah but um you know having yeah, it's really interesting. So I've never really formally used, oh, actually, I did use the psychology. But in one of my OT jobs, I, I did a stress management program. So, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, you use it every day. So it's been yeah. wonderful. Yeah. But yeah. That's, so how did I get there? Oh, I know mean, we were talking I, about um, how you got into writing. being an author because you were sort yeah. of talking about your, it was been a calling for you. Mm, mm. But even though it was this under, maybe an underlying passion yeah, yeah. that you pursued your your studies mm. then I'm assuming your career like did you work I did, as a I did I worked as an OT for 11 or 12 years and I um kind of climbed the ranks and became very well respected in my yes. career um and I moved to the UK um very early on in my career too I'd yes. only been working in Australia about 18 months mm -hmm. And I'd always had the calling to work overseas. And again, another reason I did OT is that I had done my research and I knew that I could work in London without having to sit an exam. So when they come to Australia, yeah. we've all made, we've always yeah. made them sit an exam. Yeah. But at the time when I went over, we didn't. They, our our um, degree was very well recognised, so we could get registered and work without doing an exam. It has since changed. It has since changed. OTs now do have to do an exam to work over there. So. I had always planned to travel. My dad, you know, I grew up taking like mini, little mini Eiffel Towers and after trail to show and tell when I was in prep because my dad worked in Paris for a while before he was married. And so travel has always been in our family through dad's yeah. work. Yeah. Um, and so it was always on my agenda to work. OT worked really well for that. You know, within a day I had dozens of jobs I could choose from. You know, I did a bit of locum work at first um earning great money traveling exploring etc um then I got um I really liked it I, I just instant instantly loved being in London and it's really interesting because a lot of my ancestry is from over there so I don't oh. know like a primal thing you know all of a sudden I understood why there were daffodils on Easter cards like you know that there are not daffodils out at Easter here but over there it's all about new birth and spring and life and everything so oh, interesting yeah. the simplest things so um I ended up getting sponsored by an employer so I had a full-time job sponsored by an employer 
And once you work in that for four years, then you get residency. So I ended up living and working in London as an OT for 11 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it was at the end of that time um, I got married to my husband, who is Australian. We'd met just before travelling um, when I, I worked. But you married him while you were living in London. Exactly, yeah. he happened so, to be an Aussie as well in yeah, London. Yeah. As well. yeah. Yes, wow. yes. Yeah. so he became travelling at the same time as me and we both ended up staying there. Um, very formative years. So, you know, first house, first car, both children born there you know, most of my OT career there. And I ended up quite senior in my OT career over there as well, heavily involved in the British Association of OTs. I speak at conferences, you know, um, you know, very involved. And then um, I had my first child and everything changed. Oh, as <laughs> it often does. As it often does. <laughs> and, um, yeah, um, two kind of factors. So this is where the creative me and the writing me comes back in. Yes. Actually, one step before that in my OT, I did end up specialising in report writing and complex reports and business reports. I ended up working in the private sector. So writing was my bread and butter. But That's it was- interesting. Did you, um, did that just kind of evolve or did you go looking it for It did that? evolve, yeah. It's so, interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I did my time on the wards and, look, I loved it and I loved being at the coalface and helping people and being in that role. But my particular skills ended up being more in, you know, I was managing large teams of OTs, physios, nurses for yeah. insurance companies. So I was team leading, writing reports. Yeah, that's just where my skills ended up being. Yes. Um, so, and that's where I was when I was pregnant with my first child, which happened to be real, you know, I was early 30s, thought I knew everything. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I my way around a PowerPoint document more than I did, you know, trying to help a new baby feed. Yes. So I had a really difficult birth, like majorly difficult, oh. major marriage, you oh, know, dear. thought I was going to die kind of situation, oh, um, which threw me, wasn't prepared for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I was thrown by a new motherhood. I just could not believe, with my feminist hat on, I could not believe how unprepared I was and my generation. Yes. Um, and I felt really passionately about that. And that's how my first novel got to be written. So I was at home. I didn't go back to work. I was in no state. I'd lost a lot of blood. Um, you know, I was really weak, blah, blah, blah. So yes. I had to stay home for a while. Um, I was knocked off my feet by this experience of first-time motherhood in my the air part of London that I lived in, I'd met a really lovely mum, you know, as you do in your new mother's yeah. group. And I really feel for the mums during COVID here in Melbourne who didn't have that connection. It must have been so hard because that's really the only thing that got me through, especially being overseas and not having families yes. around. Yes. Um, and she was an editor for um, a, a lovely publisher in London that did beautiful books on art and architecture and fashion, of which I had many in my house. And I had a, a house full of books. Yeah. We just connected and I'd never met anyone in publishing before in my life um, because it had all been medical and insurance and therapy. Yes, yes, it was the, yes, it was the kind of it was It was completely refreshing to me. And um, the girls were about eight months old and she said, oh, by the way, I'm going back to work on Monday. And I said, what? (laughs) Where are you? What what do you do? We'd never even asked each other what we did before children. We were that deep in (laughs) In kids. We spent each day just helping each other get through. Um, And she said, look, you know, I work for this publisher. They did that the other. And I had a look at it and I thought, oh, wow, you know, I always loved shoes. And I've got this pile of books at home of of this book called Shoes by Linda O'Keefe that everyone gives me because they know I love shoes. Yeah. I think there's a gap in the market. Um, and I didn't actually bring a copy of it to show you, but it's called the patch. So anyway, she said, look, the boss is coming over from New York next week. We're having a new ideas meeting. Would you put a one page, do your research, put a one pager together and I'll give it to my boss. So I did that. Um, this is late 90s. There is no Google. So I literally trot myself off to the Waterstones in London. As far as I could see, there were no other gift books about yeah. shoes. Did my one pager. She gave it to her boss. She liked it. She took it to the new ideas meeting. He said, yes. And would you like to do one in handbags to go with it? Because we always do companion books. I said, okay. Absolutely. <laughs> wow. Wow. And, wow. That's how, and that's how my writing started. So I very, very quickly through serendipity, um, I wrote these two books. They were published all around the world, travel, translated into different languages. And at the time, my husband was working with a, a mate doing a start tech startup, working all the hours of the earth. Yeah. 
I wanted to be at home, providing stability at home. So I thought, this is something I can do. I can actually work around, you know, parenting by writing. So I still had the massive bee in my bonnet about being unprepared first-time motherhood. So that's how I wrote my novel, The Shoe Princess's Guide to the Galaxy. That's So that's a real high heels to high chairs book. Oh, I love that, high heels to high chairs. Yeah, yeah. And I, it should have been the tagline, but I've only thought of it 20 years later. <laughs> Do you know what? There's so many women, like I can relate to that, you know. Yeah. Having worked on, I had my first baby at 20, almost 30. Yeah. And she was the first baby I'd ever held. <laughs> my baby and it was just like oh my god what do I even do with absolutely I, you know and me being a book person I I, I came home with a pile of books this high like yes my yes. mum's just laughing at me you know yeah. um, and I didn't have support around me either I didn't have family around yeah, me and it was yeah. just like oh my god very capable in my career yes but then it's just like oh my god like motherhood yeah. and I, I don't know if you felt this Emma um, but I felt like I wasn't doing anything well. I wasn't doing, because oh, I worked part-time uh, yeah. um, after the first year. And it was like, I feel like I'm failing at work. I feel like I'm failing Very, at motherhood. Yep. I feel like I'm failing at being a oh, wife. I saw it every day at work yeah. and, and yeah. colleagues of mine that were in the same situation because, and it really bugged me because, you know, I'm a perfectionist in my work. Yes. <laughs> and it bugged me massively that I was bad at this job, yes. you know, of, of being a mum because I didn't know what to do. I felt untrained. Yes. I felt that I didn't know what I was doing and I hated that feeling. Yeah. So I very quickly got up to speed and I was really diligent about it. But, you know, a lot of mums don't have that time because they, they have to go back to work full-time or part-time after a few yeah. months and everything's just this blur and this juggle yeah. and it's so stressful. Um, you know, at the time my kids were born, there, weren't, there wasn't much paternity leave. The, no. the, the, everything was awful. There was no, there was nothing. Um, and Do you know what to- I liked hearing? Oh, sorry, Emma, to, to cut you off. I was just thinking when you said about the mothers group, mm. like really supportive for me as well, and the, the, the parents group, mm. but you said the serendipity of meeting your friend there who was in mm. publishing. Mm. I reckon that's the universe. Um, I would never have published. I would not be here today if I had not been in that place at that time. Yeah. There's absolutely no way because the publishing industry is so, the gatekeeping yes. is so incredibly yeah. difficult. Um, and yeah, then I had this, you know, this burning desire to write the novel about first time motherhood and the difficulties yeah. of first time motherhood, but in a lighthearted, entertaining yes. way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was a, you know, I'd never written a novel before. I'd written plenty of business reports and things, but never a novel, never anything creative. I'd never even done a writing course. So, I mean, quite wow. stupidly in retrospect, you know. When <laughs> well, <laughs> it worked out. And, yeah. and so that was for adults, wasn't it? And then yeah. Yeah. how did you transition into kids' books? So that was published by Bloomsbury UK, the Harry Potter publisher. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I actually was in the building one day after J.K. Rowling and, like, the place was electric. You know, li- oh. literally you touched a doorknob and it was electric. Like, the, the whole building was buzzing, like, she's been in the building. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that came out in 2009 yeah. and at the time my kids were in junior school. So yes. their lovely teachers at school would invite me in to celebrate and talk about books and things. And... Um, I just loved being in the classroom, which really surprised me again, like completely out of the blue. And I, as my way of giving back to the school, I would do writing workshops and, um, you know, for for the junior school kids. Yes. There was this lovely teacher who said the next year, oh, look, I know, you know, Max isn't in my class this year, but would you come in again? Because the kids really enjoyed it. So I ended up going in again and then other teachers are here and then I go to other schools and other classrooms. And before I knew it, I was spending all my time with kids the penny took a while to drop with me. Yeah. But I suddenly realised, hang on, why aren't I writing for children? Because that's what I love and this is where I love being. I, I should, by all accounts, have been writing another chiclet novel, but it didn't yeah. appeal to me Isn't because I was choosing. Yeah. I was choosing to spend all my time with children. Yeah. So then I started putting some of my ideas um, for, and, I, and I especially love picture books. I love the creativity and the artistry and the, and the dance between words and pictures. I love, I'm really, really passionate with my OT hat on of early intervention of getting kids access to literacy before they go to school because that's the most important developmental years of yes. anyone's life is actually before you go to school. Um, and I'm so passionate about that. Um, so picture books were the perfect mix for me um, to, to launch into. And it, and it didn't happen immediately. Um, you know, I thought my, my, my novel was difficult. That was quite difficult to sell, but 
the picture book has been a really, really difficult journey, but worth it. So Wonderful Shoes, for example, was published with the 13th publisher that I approached. So 13 is definitely my lucky number. 13 is your lucky number, yes. I was, yes. I was approaching the point where I thought, you know, maybe this isn't going to happen for me. Maybe this isn't going to be my story. This yeah. isn't going to be where I'm going to end up. Um, and I was almost out of puff. Um, and, you know, little things happen. I'd reconnected with a school friend who I hadn't seen for like 20 years and she, she cottoned on to that. And she just looked at me as if she said, but why should you give up doing something that you love? Oh, lovely. That's nice. So That's good I, advice, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and then I started Deep Bags in 2017 during one of those low points. And that yeah. also, the, the positivity that I gained from Deep Bags lifted me and that um, fed into my books as well. And then in 2019, that's when I signed Wonderful Shoes. So um, at the beginning, I'm going to go back to D bags in a minute. Um, um, so the when you're saying they're like not giving up, and I think you mentioned this to me before, your friends say you're the friend that has grit. Um, you're the friend that keeps going. You're the yeah. friend that is, um, you know, the, the determination. And I can hear that even when you're sharing your story from, um, studying to work to motherhood uh. and also through to publishing um, wonderful shoes and I know and your other um, books as well and I know there's much more to that story than we will cover today so if people want to reach out to you please do um, do that I'm sure Emma would love to to share her story and um, so you the 13th publisher yes um, they said yes Yes. That they would publish. That was 2019. So that's only a couple of years ago. So we had to wait a year because the illustrator that we both really wanted was really busy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Could take us on for a year. Yes. Yes. Um, and then it was published last year in 2021. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. So um, it was published and then in Melbourne, I think maybe a week after we went into lockdown. Really yes. big lockdown. So that's really hard. Lockdown. That in, was a big publishing. Yeah. A very, you, you only get a certain window with your book, maybe maybe a six to eight week window after your book is published to get around to the bookshops, get get it in front of people, and then the next wave of books comes along. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so it was actually quite catastrophic that we went into the really big lockdown in Melbourne. So I leaned heavily into my Instagram community. Yeah. Um, of beautiful book reviewers and authors and oh, it was just incredible the support that I got there um, and that was really lovely still difficult uh, for the book because yeah. you know anyone that had a book published in lockdown it wasn't easy yeah. um, and then it got the CBCA long listing award this year in I think it was March um, wow. and that's called a notable book um, so it's a long listing for the Children's Book Council of Australia book of the year and that's yeah. announced at the same time every year. So that's the little shiny sticker that's sticker. on the so wow. That gave it a, a whole new boost and a whole new credibility, which was yeah. really, really lovely. Um, and then on top of that, we've had the, the play school, which is just lovely. And in the meantime, um, actually it was a week before I got the CBCA listing, I signed my second picture book deal with a, a bigger publisher, even a wonderful publisher called Firm Press. Um, and in fact, I've just signed another book with them last week. Oh, Emma, that's um, so exciting. Oh my gosh. And yeah. they're coming. So have, are you in the process of writing those? They're both written. So when they buy, when they acquire the book, it's already written. Uh, yeah, so the yeah. one, uh, one will be coming out in August next year. Um, yeah. and that's my love letter to children. I can't wait to share that with everyone. Oh my gosh. Yes. It's absolutely my love letter to children and how the world is a better place for having children in it. Yay. And the one coming out in March 2024 is a very strong theme about happiness. <gasps> Yay! How <laughs> exciting! How yeah, exciting! I love that one. So yeah. um, it's, yeah. it's a very dear to me as well. So yeah. Um, and just really quickly, Emma, you did mention that you were able to bring in some of your psychology, like just your general. Um, writing and creativity but the the psychology was able to get yes. yeah yes yeah, which, which is lovely to be finally yeah. you know all my worlds coming into one my ot my psychology my creativity yeah. 
um, at 54. Yeah, so oh, finally I love that. it all comes together, you know. Yeah, and, and you know what, I really love that because for me that's a very similar, um, just seeing the pieces and how they're fitted together and those, um, you know, pivotal points in my life. And at the mm. time I've kind of gone, what's happening here? Yeah. But I can see now that they have absolutely been meant to have been on my life path. Yeah, it's trusting um, the process, isn't it? Trusting the process and trusting the universe and yeah. that, it, that it does all come together. We don't have to have it all worked out early. Yeah. And I think some women, you know, as we move through those next phases of our life, sometimes women lose sight of who they are and what's happening for them. So it's mm. about hang in there like it all. Yeah, comes, hang in there. And, together. You know, I didn't set specific goals yeah. as such but yeah. I definitely as I got older had more confidence to follow my heart yeah. not, I don't know if it's my heart but my my joy what yes. what what I am yes where I yes. want to spend my yes. time um doing yes. things yeah tell me about deed bags because that's another passion of yours as well you you mentioned about you know, in your spare time growing up, you would be mm. creative and yep. um, and sewing was part of that creativity. Yeah. Tell me about deed bags. I can't explain the sewing. You know, my mum can't sew a stitch. I'm using, <laughs> I'm using the sewing machine today that she bought herself when she was forced to leave work when, I, when she was pregnant with me. Yeah. And she thought, you know, I'll do what I'm supposed to do. You know, she's a really bright lady who didn't have the opportunity to go into further education. Yes. yes. And um, was pregnant with me as, as they had to do at that time. They yeah. had to leave work. Yeah. And she thought, oh, I better do what every good housewife does. So she bought a sewing machine, <laughs> this amazing sewing, which basically sat in a cupboard for 50 years. Wow. Used it, I think, maybe three times to make a, a school play outfit for us <laughs> and then never used it. Like it's in pristine condition. And it's oh, this beautiful. mammoth machine that's basically industrial because they don't make them like that anymore. Yeah, wow. um, and I taught myself to sew on it when, when my aunt came to sew, uh, stay with us when I was about 10, I was doing my first communion and she made my dress on it. And I kind of hung around in the background. And um, when she was gone, I would take it out on weekends and I just taught myself to sew. And then I, that was my, you know, we didn't go anywhere much, you know, so that was how I filled up my time on the weekends. I loved it. Um, But interestingly, my parents say that my dad's mum, who I never met, she passed when I was a baby, was a very, very good sewer. So maybe that's come through. They've inherited, yeah, the, yeah. the family lineage. Skips yeah, I can't explain it because, you know, yeah. I love it. It, it's, it, it is mm-hmm. a happy place for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I really, you know, hours, days can pass and I wouldn't know because I just love doing it so much. Wow. Um, and I love design. I love fashion, always have. Again, I don't know where that comes from. Um, my mum's always had nice shoes and things, but not terribly, you know, you would never call her a fashionista or anything. Um, so... Yeah, when the writing wasn't going, the children's writing in particular wasn't going so well, I was talking to my hairdresser, this lovely girl <laughs> called Emma uh, also, and funnily enough, I told her this afterwards and she can't even remember the conversation. Oh, my so gosh. Gorgeous. And she'd sensed that I was a bit down about the whole writing thing and she just said one sentence which sat in the back of my head and she said, Em, if you could do anything, what would you do? And that sat in the back of my head for a few months. I didn't act on it straight away, but just sat there, sat there, sat there. And um, at the time, those boomerang bags were quite popular. It was 2017, and I've always been passionate about the environment. I love sewing. I thought I'd seen a few of them in the shops. Great idea. I thought they were a bit flimsy, perhaps. Yeah, you know, yeah. I thought I thought there was a gap for something a little bit more fashionable and stronger. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing I love more than form and function and beauty. (laughs) Must be some of my German heritage as well. Um, So I, and at the time my mum had been diagnosed with bowel cancer. Mm -hmm. So it was a real solidification, if not now, when. Um, So I just went to the store. I drove to factories around Melbourne. I sourced materials. I put my hard hat on, my high-vis vest. I um, because my dad comes from a factory background, so I've never been afraid to go into factories, which I actually really quite love. Wow, gosh, it's so, so much I, about you. Yeah, I sourced a lot of my materials um, direct from the factory, which makes the price more yes. achievable for um, the customer. Um, yeah, and I just made these mock-ups, and there was a, a market nearby, a uh, Christmas market. I, I think I did about 20-odd bags. Didn't have a clue 
if I'd sell one, but, you know, other than different friends and family. Yeah. And I was pretty happy with the design because, as you know, they've got pockets. It's a tote bag yeah, with it's pockets. It's really, love. you know. Yeah. Um, and it was a tiny market. There was hardly anyone there. It was a bit of a dud market, to be honest. Yeah. But I sold out. Wow. And I remember my husband standing behind a tree across the way when I sold my first bag. <laughs> I think he was more incredulous than I was. <laughs> you know, we sold our first bag. It was so ex- I can. It, I, it was so exciting. I can. I can still remember. I that. can feel that. I can feel that excitement. Yeah. yeah. So I thought I might be onto something here. Yeah. So that gave me the confidence to start a website, sign up, sign up with Shopify, go into it a bit harder. Yeah. Um, and then it's just been word of mouth. It's just been a really lovely. Word of mouth, it's not a massive operation, yeah. but it was always important to me that it gives back. So, you know, I wherever possible I use, re, um, you know, materials that I find that are end of roll yes. or, yeah. um, you know, save them from landfill. Um, I give a dollar from every bag to the art of the in children's charity that I've been involved with for a long time. Um, I do four charity bags a year where 100% goes. So, you know, there's a strong giving back component to it as well as the good that they do simply by using a bag and not a plastic bag. So... Mm-hmm. It's all good. And the community that I've met through that, my goodness, just the loveliest people, you included. Oh, my gosh. I've got my, for anybody that's watching on the um, the video, I've got my beautiful bespoke bag oh, that awesome. Emma and I designed together. It's a blue sparkly denim with a silver heart and silver straps. And it that's my briefcase. That's my shopping bag that's my go-to um bag I just love love I went to try and buy some more of that sparkly last week and can't get it oh so that's (laughs) um so it's a um I've only got enough to make two more little bags not as big as yours um but yeah once and that's the thing once they're gone they're gone once they're gone and do you know what I love Emma I really love that I love um you sort of have that limited edition run which I really love so you're not going to be seeing 100 million people Goodness the no. same one. They're all very oh unique. They're just beautiful and just the energy and love. Yeah. And it really is, um, that's where we connected with the, the deed bags and I got you to make that one. And just the love that went into it, I could feel mm. um, was amazing. It was A lot of people beautiful. saw that. And, and that's, that really boosted me. And I got yeah. so much feedback and still do. I'm, I'm sure that went, shone through in my writing. And that just gave me more confidence. And, what you know, I don't think it was a coincidence that after D-Bags, things started happening. Yes. And, you know, there's that saying, you know, create, is it success breeds success or creativity, creativity, yes. Yes. creativity you know, that yes. kind of flows yes. from one another? Yeah. Do you um, know what, for me, that's that like attracts like when you're in that, you know, that space. So if, if sewing's bringing you joy, it's your happy, you've said it's your happy place and mm. writing's your happy place. Mm. So when the writing maybe wasn't, um, you know, happening how you were wanting it to or as quickly, yes. then moving into the sewing, which is, an, you know, another love and passion that I think that's kind of lifted that vibration and then it's probably freed up some bits around the I think it did. writing. I think, I, yeah, I think. Yeah, if I look back, I just don't think it's a coincidence. No, you know? I don't think so. And, and I think. You know, having listened when you were sort of saying that full circle, when I said, how did you get to have the um, wonderful shoes read on play school and, you know, mapping back your journey through school, even though your passion was creativity, writing your, you know, your plays and as growing up, you've almost come full circle, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. Is, not to say that that's the end of the circle, but it's. Yeah, it's- but interestingly, I'm using my OT as well. So yeah. I've just been um, I've just been asked to speak at a, a professional development conference up in um, Central New South Wales for the the CBCA, and it's to a group of early years teachers, and it's completely what I'm passionate about, which is picture books for children before they start school, and and you know from an OT point of view, there's so much a book. And a story gives yes. more than the words on the page, yes. you know. Yes. Um, yes. There's the, the social interaction, the the closeness, the, the the eye scanning, you know, simply learning how to scan. You know, you'd be amazed how many kids these days start school. They've never held a pencil. They've never turned a page. The, the yeah, fine because labor- of the electronic devices. Yeah, yep. They've yeah. never turned a page. They um, th- th- There's a lot going on behind the wow. scenes neurologically 
with reading and socially and emotionally yes, as well. Yes, yes. Um, so it's it powerful. That's really powerful. Yeah, so it's, it's 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 for me. I'm really glad that I'm able to use my OT as well as my creativity. Oh, how exciting! How exciting! Yeah. Tell me about what. Um, I mean, I know that the deed bags and the writing are passion and they'd be fun. What else do you do for um, to fill your cup? Oh, what are some of the things? Travel. That you, travel. travel. Yes. Yes. I thought you were going to say that. Yeah. I thought you were going to say that, yeah. Yeah, and interestingly, I've just been on a little mini trip in August overseas, um, which was a really last-minute decision, hooked on to the end of my husband's business trip. And I just had forgotten how important travel was to me as a person, you know, as someone that's lived all over the world, all over Australia. Um, when I was in London, you know, you're either exploring different parts of London or you're hopping on the Eurostar or you're going to Prague for the weekend or, you know, I had forgotten <clears throat> I had forgotten how important it was to me as a person to explore the world. Um, and I came back from that holiday completely rejuvenated. Oh. And, you know, I had the same problems and issues and concerns that I had before I left waiting for me when I came back. But as a person, I felt just so more equipped to deal with them wow. and so more centred and ha happy mm. and um, content well. <clears throat> That's interesting, like the, the, the travel, and I think a lot of people will resonate with that, but travel might not be their thing that fills their cup, but what... <laughs> What I'm hearing you say is by doing the thing that you love or one of the things that you love is about that rejuvenation and being refreshed to be able to come back and, and deal with life but with a little bit more um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Being around it maybe. It's interesting. There was, yeah. there was a really interesting article in the paper a couple of weeks ago. I actually um, printed it off and it was talking about a study that they've done on the benefits of travel with, for people with dementia. But I think the, the findings are equally, yes. equally transferable yeah. to all of us, you know, yeah. because, you know, I, on a daily basis, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good with nutrition because that's yeah. always been an, um, yes. an interest of mine. So, you know, I eat well, but exercise is something that falls. It's one of the first yeah. things to go when I get too much on and I spend yeah. far too much time either at a desk writing or at a table sewing. Yes. All of a sudden, I'm doing 10, 15, 20,000 steps a day yeah. on holiday. I'm out in the fresh air. I'm spending time with my companion who I probably haven't spent enough time with because for the last 20 years we've been parenting and working yes. and on this this roller coaster, this rabbit wheel, you know, a mouse, whatever you call it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's benefits in disconnecting from your everyday yes. routine and spending more time outside, simply just exercising and being in the sun and exploring places. And, and also this article talks about getting to know yourself better. You decide, well, where am I going to spend my hard-earned money and my valuable short time I love investing? Do I go to the fashion museum or do I go to this other museum or do I go to a nature park or do I go here or go there? So you get to know and reevaluate yourself better. Yeah. You connect with your traveling companion again better mm. you connect with the world better mm. because you're you're tasting new food you're seeing new sites you're understanding history of how another place came to be and how you fit into that and your country fits into that so when I read this article and it talks all about that I thought that's exactly how I felt when I came back and I had forgotten that feeling I love that and and it is I think for a lot of people COVID has had a, a big impact and especially yeah. Melbourne you guys went through and toughest lockdown I think you, didn't you? House, you know so yeah. even exploring your own neighborhood was yeah. limited yeah yeah so that's really nice to reconnect with what it is that fills your cup mm. um, and for all those reasons that you mentioned about that um, renewed enthusiasm yeah. and that is um, so I would encourage people to sort of think about what is it that does fill their cup and when I ask people that some people are able to answer it really easily others are like oh I've kind of forgotten what does because I'm so busy doing things for others yes I've forgotten about me so it's a really awesome. nice reminder Emma that we yeah. and it doesn't have to be overseas travel you know no, like, no. I'm not from Melbourne and I've been spending a lot of time in North Melbourne the last couple of weeks and I may as well be in London, you know, like I'm exploring streets. Exploring and some new elements. That's cool. That is very. I find that really energising. That's cool. What's next for you? 
What's next? So you've mentioned you've got a couple of books in the pipeline. What else yeah. is next for you? Oh, I am, you know, I'm in a new phase. I've had one, one my, this beautiful daughter that prompted me to, to write that novel about clueless first-time motherhood. <laughs> just moved out of the way. Um, and so you've my, done motherhood okay. You've done motherhood yeah, okay, I, I would I say. So. I yes. think so. Um, yes, the, the the my little my little um, bird has flown the nest, and she's very confident and happy. So yes. I'm, I'm feeling good about that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, my son's first year uni. So yeah, my husband and I are at this real fight that creeps up on you. I must say, yes. very unexpectedly, all of a sudden, it's mm. you're here again, the two of you, which you haven't had for 22 years. Yes. Um, so that's been really, really. Um, discombobulating at first you know um oh hello who are you <laughs> do you know what that could be a whole um another podcast i am been going through that as well because my kids are a, a little bit older than yours but they've both left home and it is about that what does that now mean for us as a couple but also there's a, a lot of my girlfriends who and not in relationships and what does that mean for them as individuals yeah. as well yeah, so it's yeah. about it's a next phase of life yeah. and it's just like oh oh what do yeah. I want this to look like yeah, yeah that's right yeah so I'm, I'm really happy that I did persist with the writing because yes. I definitely see that as part of my future and I, and I've actually got more time to commit to it as well than I've ever had which is wonderful mm. um so I, I'm going to really enjoy traveling and talking more and doing more seminars and things I think and writing and really you know um taking off with that which is lovely that's beautiful and emma where can people find you we've got we've got the details in the show notes but on instagram yes it's emma.bowed.au yeah, yeah. And if you and go to my website, emmabowd, all one word, dot com, there's links to all the socials. There's there. links to all the socials and deed yeah. bags. Have a, um, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but you will have a Christmas range coming out. I know you're working yeah. very, very hard for that. I don't want to put more pressure on you, but I'm sure our some of our listeners will love to check yeah. out your bags. I've got my order um, for another one. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a little um, bit going on the last few weeks, so they might be a week or two late coming onto the website. But they're, that's they're, how, yeah, that's, 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 that's you know, it could be a, a Christmas gift or a New Year's gift or a just an everyday gift. Yeah. Emma just doesn't do them for for Christmas. There, um, they're there and they're beautiful. So deed Thanks. bags and all the details <laughs> are in the show notes. So, oh Emma, we, I think this has just opened the doors about who you are and how you do life. Any last tips you'd like to share? Oh, goodness. Because um, yours is very much about trusting the universe. When we, we first talked, it was around. Um, yeah, I, I think I think you asked me or, you know, something, yeah. so, you know, what what if you had to look at your life, how, how do you live it? Yeah. And I, I, I jotted down a few things and yeah. I think um, a lot of it, you know, I have to say I was very lucky to have good parents. And mm -hmm. when I was younger, I really bristled when people say, oh, you're so lucky. And I'd say, no, no, I work hard. You know, I'm a really hard worker. Yeah. And yeah. I would really bristle at the word lucky. But I know with age and experience that I am extremely lucky. Mm. Um, so, yeah, my dad was always a very positive mindset person and always, always coached us in thinking P. That's his little thing. Um, and mum was a very hard worker with strong convictions and, the, yeah. and kind of giving back um she did a lot of work for unemployed youth when I was younger so I think that stuck with yeah. me yeah. so I guess you know I do I live by the courage of my convictions oh, I give sorry. back you know my dad is probably the kindest person you will ever meet in your life so kindness is really important so whatever you whatever I do I like to be authentic yeah give back to do it with kindness I really enjoy collaborating with other people and that's what I another thing I really enjoy about the picture books is that it's a team that put it together it's not just you and the illustrator there's a publisher there's designers there's lots of people working in the background and then you know so I do enjoy that um yeah but I think that's the most things you know and with my own kids you know I've always said you know um don't don't have a wishbone, have a backbone so oh I love it <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so it's, it's about it, it, kind of having a bit of an idea of what you want but actually getting in there and making it happen yeah as well. yeah things just don't happen by magic you know no. you've got to you've got to have the graft you've got to you've got to you've got to do the work 
Yes, absolutely. Oh, Emma, that has just been such a joy and such a um, pleasure to chat with you. Oh, thank Hugs you. Hugs and happiness. Well, I, love, I love us sitting here in our pink too. I know we've got our got our our different elements of pink on. That sound, um, that pink vibe happening. Oh, so, yeah. and I love everything you do in 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 your space. It's just so it's so useful and so. Oh, you know, thank you. I, I just love it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Emma. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Here we are again after the chat and Emma and I were continuing and we were sort of talking about some of the key key messages and Emma, you were sharing about following your intuition, trusting your intuition. Mm. And I think that's something that I've probably only become more aware of as I've got older and it's yes. so cliched. But if I look back um, at those key points that you say, you know, that that end up evolving and rolling and, and forming your life's journey, having maybe the quiet time or the headspace to to follow your intuition and, and think about what what do I do um, and what am I doing when time stops, when you're in that flow state. Um, and I, I think you said, you know, some people have to really stop and think, oh, well, what does make me happy? Well, think about that. What, what, what do you do? And there is something for everyone. It might be playing the piano. It might be, it can be anything. It really. can be anything, can't it? Yeah. And you were also sharing about, you know, when you're in your happy place, that time, you lose track of time. And mm -hmm. I, I think, um, you know, sometimes people think that's very cliche about your happy place. But for me, it's not. It's about where is it that brings you joy? It's a, real, it's, a, it's a valid recognition, you know, like I'm like yourself, I'm not into this hyper toxic positivity. No, no, you know? no. Um, it just, no. yeah, we're not. No. But th there's a real value in understanding yourself, like that travel article was saying, you know, there's, there's value to be had from, from stepping aside and spending, you know, especially as mums, you know, if you can get a week or a weekend or even a day where you haven't got, that responsibility, that 24-7 responsibility of looking after another little person um, and, and, and understanding what is important to you, mm. um, it's really strong. It's really valuable. Yeah. And it, and it really a happier person. Absolutely. Oh, and I, for me, it gets back to the, uh, the, um, that oxygen mask when they talk in the plane that if anything happens, put your, 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 your own oxygen mask on first before you can help others. Yes. For me, it's about looking after yourself and and your happy place is just one element of that. It's not mm. the only element, but it's about knowing yourself and what brings you joy, but what also doesn't bring you joy. What are the things that trigger? Mm. And, and when you know yourself, do more of what you love and less of what you don't. Is. Exactly, because we have a choice, you know, generally. Yeah. Generally. Yeah. We're, generally, know, yeah. We have yeah. Um, Can I just rewind just quickly? Po toxic positivity hear that term a lot and I agree with you what's your version of toxic positivity oh you know it's like you can be anything you want to be you know um you always just roll off the tongue kind of yeah. sounds yeah um yeah. I you know my dad you know I grew up you know when I had to move from North Queensland to Brisbane for uni it was really hard I was young I was yeah. 16 I'd only just turned 17 <clears throat> And he would ring me every day. He was a great believer in positive mindset. So mm. I, I'm that's where I'm kind of coming from is a positive yeah, yeah, mindset. Yeah, um, self-belief, you know, my parents yeah. have always given us self-belief. Yeah. Um, positive mindset, not just roll off the tongue. You can do that's it. That's what I think too. And for me, that um, toxic <laughs> positivity is around oh, just be happy all the time. Just don't, you know, just ignore the, the negative emotions and just be happy, just be happy. It's about, for me, acknowledging all the emotions. Yeah. And if you're angry, allow yourself to be angry. Oh, but don't get stuck in it. Don't get stuck in the yeah. anger. For me, the, the, the positivity is about looking at what's going on and how can I move through what's going on? It's not denying what's going on. Absolutely. And Absolutely. there was one thing, um, there was a, an acquaintance who had been diagnosed with quite, in my mind, quite a, I was going to say severe. I don't know if severe is the right word, but an illness. And her response was, I'm just going to ignore it. I'm just going to pretend it's not there and it will go away. 
I, I can kind of see that, but for me, it's about going, well, what's going on? I'm angry about this yeah, and not denying how I'm feeling, but not staying stuck in how I'm feeling. Yeah. With illness, you know, you know, mm-hmm. and a lot of things, that denial is probably the first stage of this. Is it the yeah. five or the seven stages of grief? You know, right. and yeah. one goes through it and we go up and yeah. down, you know, denial, yeah. acceptance, anger. Yeah. And, and that's all part of it. It is part of it. But if we stay in that pretending everything's okay all of the oh, time. You've, you've got to move through healthy. it. Yeah, you've yeah. got to move through it. And um, and like I said, you know, I came back from this this holiday refreshed, rejuvenated, able I felt more able to tackle, like I said, the same yeah, problems yeah. and issues that were there before I left. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't come back saying my world is cured and everything yes. is <laughs> amazing and perfect. It just never is. Yeah. Um, but I felt stronger. I felt, yeah. and everyone commented too. Like, you know, my son said, oh, mum, you're really buzzing. You know, like wow. I just had forgotten. Yes. Have I forgotten? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's that's. That's great to hear, isn't it? Because sometimes we don't realise the heaviness of the energy that we're carrying as well. But other, especially others for women can... of our age, the sandwich generation, you know, yeah. we're caring for young families, which we have done for many years. Yeah. We're caring for elderly parents. Yeah. Um, we've got a lot on our plate. Yes. And, and sometimes, yeah. and I'm guilty of it, um, you know, you can get, like you said, bogged down in that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I found? Uh, like, um, your dad's not well at the moment. Mm. I, I've been through a similar experience when my dad wasn't well and I lost myself in so busy giving, giving, you know, being, we talked about being advocates for yep. our aging parents in the sort of the healthcare system. Sometimes we can lose ourselves in the busyness of life. And for me, it's about ensuring that I cut out that wedge for me. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. And um, for me, I need to get back to exercise. Yeah. So prior to COVID, I was super fit and yeah. really enjoyed my exercise and yeah. being in lockdown and everything. That that was the first thing to go for me. So yeah. um, I need to carve out that time again. And I know that and I need to do that. Yeah. Um, so like I said, I'm pretty good with the nutrition. I'm pretty good with walking the dog, but that's not enough. No, that's I'm with you too. I'm with you too. Yeah. Well, thank you for this added little bit of bonus um, goodness. So thank you. So we better stop. I know we better stop. We better stop. Thanks for that, gorgeous. Thank you.